I V M. This is Storytellers and Storytellers live on tape. You're listening to me, Vineet Kanabar, on the I V M Podcast Network. On today's episode. I am delighted to be joined by the OG indie pop queen, and in this one, OG means original goddess indie pop queen, Sunita Rao. Hi, Sunita. Welcome to Storytellers and Storytellers. Delighted to have you on. Equally delighted to be on this. I have heard so much about you, and I'm very happy to be here. Glad, glad to have you, and I'm so glad that uh, this is your fir- first podcast as well. It's something that I take a lot of pleasure in, in getting new people introduced to the medium, and I'm so glad you're joining us here. Thank you for the time. Indeed, indeed, yeah, indeed. When I, whenever I hear the term podcast, I always ask people, "What is a podcast?" And now I'm in it. <laughs> Fantastic, right? Let me get us started by asking you something that I've wanted to ask you for a while. Um, I mean, both my wife and I are huge fans of of the work you've mm-hmm. done, the albums you've had in the past. It's been thirty years that that you're part of the scene, the the pop scene, and the music industry at that time has in, in that time has gone undergone a sea change, a massive change in the way that music is produced, the way it's distributed, the way you engage with fans, even live concerts for that matter, right? With technology and with social media and, and so much other kinds of media and distribution coming in, I want to get us started by by getting your notes on how things have. Changed or remained the same for you since when you started? Right? I think eighty nine was when uh, Pari Hume came out. Eighty nine, ninety, and and now you have a song coming out in in twenty 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 one. How how have things changed for you from from the industry's perspective? Okay, so let me get a little specific over here. It's exactly three decades of Pari. Wow! I released the album into oblivion in nineteen ninety one. Right, ninety one. Right. And I and, and we are in twenty one now. Right. So the reason I say into oblivion is because I received absolutely no promotion for that album when it was released. Um, my record company knows this. We've also talked about it, and I've spoken about it in the media quite a bit. So it's right. not like it's a secret or anything like that. But um, of course, they were interested in pop artists, but not interested enough to promote us with enough with enough financial backing. And as a result, nobody really knew it was being released, and it was in the middle of the Gulf War. Right. In '91, if you remember, so it was a Gulf War happening, and and nobody was really interested in any um, indie pop album released by Sunita Rao at that time. Even though I have to say I had achieved a certain level of popularity with Senorita, which was my right. first album in '89. Um, uh, in fact, it was quite uh, interesting. I got a very, very wonderful break on national network uh, in a program called Pop Time. Which was right. on Doordarshan, and Louis Banks was the one who produced the album, and he he gave me a brilliant start. He kind of introduced me to the whole industry, and I was very lucky to have that, have a person like him, have a program like that to be in, you know, instant recognition. And the album actually sold, like in those days, what was known as platinum, like a seventy-five thousand right. copies was a lot for a for right. an indie pop artist. But having said that, the Pari album didn't get its due until nineteen ninety-three, which is when MTV came into the picture. I I was very very aware of what was going on. I had been watching MTV for years. I had uh, quite a few friends, fortunately, in the industry. So I begged and borrowed and stole and put together a measly three lakhs. And I uh, I got a brilliant director Ram Madhwani to agree to make the video because he absolutely loved the song. Right. And um, I I actually got a sponsorship from Colgate just a little bit and my uncle Bobby's sister. And we managed to make the video, and I personally put the video cassette into an envelope and emailed it to—I mean, couriered it to Singapore to MTV. Right. And which was um, much to the dismay of my record company. They're like, "How can you go over our heads?" But I said, "Like, I mean, you guys—you guys were not doing anything." Right. And I mean, I respected them. I was on contract with them, but nothing was really happening. So anyway, in the end, I'm sure they were very, very happy because it, it became what it what it did. So I mean, these are things which would never happen today. Right. You know, you're talking about what is different. Everything is different. And um, again, I got a brilliant push. Um, uh, first of all, uh, it was you know it was coincidental. MTV and Pari happened at the same time, so people were watching you know an Indian artist along with all the international artists on the screen, and that was that was huge right and the and the other interesting thing was i suddenly got an offer to sing at the film fair awards in 93 and um that was where i got an opportunity to sing in front of the entire nation 
Right. So both my both my initial songs actually in my career had a, a, a wonderful platform. It's very very difficult to get that kind of platform today. The other thing that is very different is the luxury of time. I took my own sweet time between releases, and um, uh, I was continuously touring. I had a lot of a lot of stuff going on. So my next release after that was in '96. So, and I still had people waiting to see what I was going to come up with. They still remember. In fact, Pari by then had really grown organically. So right. people were still listening and enjoying and appreciating the video when I came out with my next one, even though there was such a long gap. Now today you can kind of sit at home and you can make yourself a star if you know how to do it. Absolutely. You can navigate, you can, yeah, you can navigate the internet, you can do your social media thing. You know, you, don't, you have to know how to monetize you can completely manage yourself, um, which was impossible earlier. You had to, to, a certain, to a certain extent, you know, depend on the people around you and, and uh, support from the industry. Having said that, a certain amount of support from any kind of an institution is necessary for any artist. So how can you do it all alone, especially if you're independent? Absolutely. It's different if you're in a movie, then you have the producer and the director backing you. If you're an artist, um, you need the, a label of some sort to help you, I feel. But then the labels themselves need enough backing. Right. They need to also promote you enough. So it's, it's, it's a growing industry still. But we, I suppose we are the people who kind of put a foot in the door for these artists. And we said, you don't necessarily have to only stick to playback. You can do your own thing. You can still be recognized. Absolutely. I think that's where the initial epithet that I gave you was the OG queen of Indie Pop. I think the work that, yeah. um, that you did back then and in the way that uh, things were promoted, really open up for Indian audiences the kind of music that was just not available or not pushed mm -hmm. enough at that time, right? Yeah, I think yeah. some of those challenges still persist to this day. We're still largely film-dominated uh, music industry. We're still largely, you know, taking and borrowing from old songs and remixing them and playing them out there. While there are, you know, there is a groundswell of original music coming from artists which are not film related it is still the, the consumption the domination of film is is far far more exponentially higher than um, than for indie pop artists let me ask you this as well i was reading a very old interview of yours uh, from 2001 i think it was a women's day interview in 2001 mm -hmm. and you talked about remixes then about how remixes were eating into royalties and revenues for artists original artists and their uh, you know, a difficult thing to reconcile for original artists when they spend years researching and developing music and creating a song and then someone comes on and just remixes it. Do you feel that way about remixes uh, today as well? Or, or has, has your point of view uh, sort of slightly changed? See, I, I, I do believe that imitation is the best form of flattery. Okay. Right. So if somebody is going to love your tune enough to take it and remix it, then so be it as long as you do it well. Right. And uh, as far as originality is concerned, I mean, one doesn't really know what has been taken from where, where one has got the inspiration to write the music. If you have something original and if you're so fiercely protective about it, then you have to make sure you have your publishing rights and you have your copyright situation organized and all of that. I'm not to say that I did all of that. I right. was hopeless with all that in the beginning. Right. I mean, I wrote off Pari Hume long ago, you know, if I made, I always say, if I made a rupee for every single place that Pari Hume was paid, I wouldn't be sitting here in Mumbai doing an interview. I'd be on a chalet in the Riviera or something <laughs> like that. But, you know, so uh, talking about, you know, remixes, I think you're definitely going to hear something that has been released before. That's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Even if it is original today, at some point, somebody is going to want to either cover it or do their own version of it. It's going to happen. Right. So I, initially, I used to be kind of against it because it used to be literally just taking an old tune and putting some kind of a contemporary rhythm to it and then leaving it out right. and then making lots and lots of money on it. That's different. I mean, see, for example, even if you take a DJ, like earlier, DJs weren't considered artists in themselves. They were like, oh, you're cut pasting. What are you doing? But a DJ now today, you have to be a recording engineer. You have to be quite skilled. You have to know what pieces can go with what other pieces. You have to know the audience are targeting. You can do entire shows as a DJ. Right. So that itself has become a craft. So like that, there are remixes and there are remixes. I hear you. Like I used to hear, I used to hear Pari Hume played on Michael Jackson beat. Right. That's not a remix. Right. Okay, I've heard Abke Baras played on some other, I don't know, some recognizable Western tune. I forgot what it was, but... I don't, that's what I'm saying. You don't remember it. Right. It doesn't stick with you. Right. And so many people have asked me, do you want to do a remix of Pari? 
I just feel it is necessary to to do something that you that you have conviction about. Right. You know, if you have the conviction, um, then it will be uh, automatically received more positively. You know. Sure, absolutely. I think it's important that remixes are a collaboration of the vision for the song instead of it just being like, "Hey, this is a hit song, and I'm just going to take it and put some beats onto it and sort of." propagate it further without any sort of collaborative vision or working on it together. I think you know, what you said about DJs today is, is so very true, right? Earlier it used to yeah. be just some guys taking um, on a laptop or on a uh, yeah. keyboard, just remixing some music. And now it's so much more, right? A DJ is a producer, a DJ is a composer, a DJ is so much more than, than what it used to be. I think there's definitely um, a lot to be said about how far remixes have come as well. Uh, mm-hmm. I want to ask you one more thing before we move on to talking about some of your music. You mentioned that you've taken a lot of time between releases. And, I, and I've seen that in, in the disco- discography as well. What was your process or what's been your process between releases from one to the other? How do you transition? What goes on in your head? Where do you seek inspiration? How does that come about for you? Or how is, what has been your process of the last sort of three decades here? Oh, okay. Look, I'm a very instinctive person. I go by my gut. Sure. So when I was like... Um, all of 16 years old and I was doing I was doing my HSE examination and doing Greece at the same time. I would do two papers and then go off to Sophia Baba Hall and do two shows. Right. So at that point, there was no, I, you know, no room for any kind of thinking or planning beyond a certain uh, level. Um, I was simultaneously uh, making applications to study abroad uh, economics and I was also making applications to study musical theater abroad. It was like, I don't know what, what came when, frankly. Right. I don't even remember the chronology of the whole thing. I wanted to do it all. Right. Because I happen to have a lot of passions. I, I love to sing. I love to dance. I love to act. I always say that if I, if I didn't, um, if I wasn't, if I didn't become a singer, I would have definitely become an actor. You know, in the proper sense of the word, even though I have definitely done a lot of theatre. Right. But it's always been musical theatre. And only recently I did things which, more, which were more um, spoken word oriented as opposed to singing. So uh, I've always gone about things very organically. And right through those 16, 17, 18, you know, those, that, that age, I was writing a lot of lyrics and I was writing a lot of concepts and ideas. I had this huge file, you know, and uh, I had written a bunch of things like uh, the Seeds of Pari, whomever so was on then. You know, I used to make a list of all the music that I loved to listen to. I used to suddenly have an idea of what I want to write about and note it down. And so I had pages and pages and pages of things before I was even approached by a record company. Right. So when I was doing Greece and when uh, Sanjeev Kohli from HMV approached me and asked me to do a, a Hindi pop album, I had a lot of English stuff with me. And I put my nose up, I'm from St. Xavier's, I'm doing Greece, I learned Carnatic music, I'm not going to go into Hindi pop. Right. You know, but then my mother, my mother, who's my biggest inspiration, who's a, she's a, like a ghazal and geet and bhajan singer and has herself released a number of albums with HMV. She said, look, if you want to really reach your masses, if you want to reach the audience, you're going to have to sing in Hindi. So then I went back at the age of 19 to the record company and I said, okay, let's do this. And I signed a contract with HMV and I did Senorita. Right. But the thing is that I did it with Louis Banks. Right. Which was the Louis Banks. Which was the reason why it, the Louis Banks, the legendary, beautiful, living legend um, Louis. And the lovely, affectionate, cuddly Louis. <laughs> right. All of those things. <laughs> Absolutely. And, um, you know, um, you know uh, at such a young age, I had an opportunity to work with somebody so big you know, we had limited budgets, like I said. So but I had all these ideas flowing. I said, I want to do a rock and roll song. I want to do a breakdown song. I want to do a Latin song. And when we did it all, I had absolutely zero restrictions either from the record company or from Louis, or from anybody. Right. So I was able to do all those things. And so my ideas, which I had originally thought about in English, I started using them in this. And we got a lyricist and there you got your Hindi pop album. Right. Okay. Then um, I had al- always been working in the advertising uh, world. Okay, I've been like doing jingles. You can call me JQ now, Jingle Queen. But um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm OG to JQ. Um, <laughs> um, you know, so, um, so I was doing a lot of jingles with Leslie. Right. Uh, Leslie Lewis. So of course, the natural thing would be after uh, Louis, with whom I also did so many jingles orig- originally, and he did the music of Greece. So that's how I knew him. Amul Chocolate, in fact, was one of my favorite, uh, famous ones with Louis. And 
And so Leslie and I obviously started recording, I mean, uh, you know, thinking about doing another album. And then HDMB said, do your second one. Leslie was the automatic choice. Sure. So that was barely a couple of, couple of years later. So in the process of promoting Senorita, we were already beginning to record Pari. Right. And I was already on the road. I was already touring. I already got offers because of, that, like I told you, that pop time show. And so I said, forget about economics. And I said, okay, this is going to be my career. You know, and... Uh, um, it was du- during one of my performances at the Madras Film Fair Awards. I was approached by a very, very, very big person. I don't want to mention any names sure. in the South Indian film industry, you know, and said, would you like to act in films? And I said, I'm sorry, I really want to focus on my music, you know. Right. Then, then the next few years, I couldn't believe it. I mean, it just overwhelmed me. Overwhelmed me. I just, I started getting offers for concerts and I put together an entire troupe and for 50, years, that is basically what I was doing, 15, 20 years maybe. And I got offers to even perform abroad. And in the middle of all of this, I still had that file. I knew I had more ideas. I had more more things that I wanted to do. And uh, of course, I mean, I'm very, very friendly with all the all the musicians in the industry. So I knew Ranjit right. very, very well, the incredible drummer Ranjit Bharat. Right. And I said to myself, I said, I, he's a producer. He's definitely a very good producer. I think I did a couple of jingles with him also back then. And uh, and he, uh, I, I had to really chase him. They're asking me, you know, why does so much of time go by? Right. You know, it's like what John Lennon said, life is what happens to you when you're busy making other plans. Right, absolutely. So, I mean, I really wanted to work with Ranjit, but I had to really wait for him. I had to wait for him to be ready. Right. And he had just come back from Rajasthan and he had just collected a whole bunch of wonderful audio samples from there. And, you know, he and, and I loved Rajasthani music and that is what made us connect. Right. And I remember the first time I met him, he, he played this beat on his chest, you know, like. And that was Dekka Dekka. Right. And I knew already in my head that I wanted to write a song about domestic violence. And this was it. And I wanted to use South Indian instruments. And so we used the kanjira. But I also wanted to, he suggested using rock guitar. And I said, yes, let's, because we wanted to express the anger. Right. You know, so that's how that started developing. But then when you're working with such a busy person, it takes a year to do the album with that person. Right. And then your own personal life also takes over. I was yeah. in a relationship. It was taking a long, you know, it had its own tumultuous twists and turns. Sure. So there's a lot of stuff going on. I, in fact, I, 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 got, I got fatigued at one point. After I finished the recording of Tala, of uh, Talash, yeah, that was with Ranjit, I was finished. Right. I was absolutely finished. Emotionally, physically, vocally, everything. I was finished. And... I had been singing for 20, 15 years or something by then right. to audiences of everything from 4,000 to 100,000 people with insufficient monitoring and, you know, just with my own little group of people to another, one city to another, then sometimes Africa, and then sometimes, you know, um, uh, Russia. I mean, it was crazy. It was really crazy. And um, so then again, I, I took a sabbatical. Sure. And uh, during that, and also along, along the way, I also came back and I did some more theatre. Right. I did um, End of La Mancha. So after 83 to 88, then there was a stop for some time. Then I came back to 2000 with Man of La Mancha. And then I released Abke Baras. Right. I think that's how it happened in that sequence. So I was touring with La Mancha and I was, um, and that was my filmy one. That was with Anand Rajanan. Right. So, and again, if you're chasing a film person, it uh, takes forever. Right. Oh my goodness. He was delightful, but uh, it was like so difficult to just pin him down and work on a session. So that itself took a long time to do, you know? Sure. And um, and then then I, I started thinking about this whole f- fusion-oriented thing. Um, and I made demos. You know, I made demos with my friends, my friends from Rock Machine, Zubin and Mahesh Dinaikar and all of them. You know, I just, I sat and made all these demos, you know, and, and that also took some time because I was still gigging. And I took those demos, I took them all the way to New York. I met Lenny White. Right. And, you know, you know you're talking about things that take months, months, months. Absolutely. And, uh, and then when I, I uh, worked, which is what the album was supposed to originally be titled. Right. It was five whole years in the making. Wow. Oh, I used to do all those gigs at Jazz by the Bay, you know, not just Jazz by the Bay. Right. And during the course of rehearsals, they came up with this Carnatic music mixed with uh, contemporary uh, arrangements with Gino, Sheldon and Sangeet, the Nexus. And uh, they themselves, they were so busy to pin down. Right. 
like a uh, sangeet in the middle went and became a superstar with uh, asma and gino was doing so many shows with louis i don't blame him he had so much work coming in i was happy he was doing the work right you know they were also young sheldon of course was on his own journey you know so we wrote the album together but all of us were still doing our own thing it was only in the fifth year that i actually told them i said listen let's just produce this and let's come out with this and once again it was reason to oblivion right i had a contract with somebody who would completely took me for a ride he just made about 300 cd what is we had a, a launch yeah we had a launch in hard rock cafe right and um i mean i i did this fantastic show you know where i had backing vocalists and i had gino sangeet shell and everybody was performing with me and i mixed dehka dehka with love to love you baby and i mean it was just fantastic okay and he this gentleman i'm again not going to give any names he came there with a few cds to launch and then disappeared and he was a personal friend of mine so like an idiot i had not signed a contract right so and it takes time also to emotionally get over these kind of setbacks you know but i had the support and love of the industry i was still getting concerts and uh, and then of course so many who was a very very old friend of mine from channel v right she said you know she said sunita you know I, i this album is just so beautiful it's so unfortunate what's happened with it i'm not going to be able to release it originally as bucked but i will take a few songs from uh, from the album and i will release them on artist aloud right and so began my relationship with artist aloud right so many has been on this show as well actually we had a wonderful conversation about about the journey of of music and, and what a wonderful uh, business talent on on the yeah, music yeah absolutely she's terrific so um, she yeah. took my songs and uh, that's how they're available today and that's how you can hear them right and we had to make it indian girl that's the name of song which i of a song which i based on amrita varshini which is a beautiful uh, south indian rock mm-hmm. and um we we shot a new cover and we released it with a different kind of an artwork but it's the same album it's vakt basically that was in 2008 right right and that was the same year that i got married <laughs> and then that was sort of the last album that came out before you started releasing music again sort of 2018 2019 if i'm right absolutely that was 2000 and, yeah that was 2008 uh, that was when i got married then a few years later i made the video of sunzara right for the girl child right. which my husband shot and Rachel Rubin directed so the, see the, the just just making of the album and releasing it is one stage you know because it is such a struggle in the industry by the time you actually get down to even making one video from it it's been a couple of years right so it's like you're all the time like like Stevie Nicks said you know like in the river of music so but not everybody really knows or sees it right that's there's just so much to unpack in in that uh whirlwind tour of your of your journey in music uh i mean the story about vakt and only having 300 copies at the time of release is just insane it Ooh. i mean i can draw parallels to to what taylor swift just did right with her re-recording her recent album her original album the ones that she didn't mm. have rights to to reclaim her music and it just i mean it's changed so much you you never hear of something like this to happening to an established superstar yeah, at, at exactly. this time and it just goes to show how quickly the industry has at least formalized and become better and and, and full credit to to people like so many who who looked out for the artists and and still continue to look out for uh, for artists and emerging emerging artists all the way yeah the when you were talking i think i i could almost see the passion with which you speak about live music and performing you know i feel like that's something that's been super important to you over the years is that what what you love most about the entire creative music making music performance um, process is is that is that your first love performing especially for live masses i think i have to admit i have to admit there's no place like stage right i'm definitely definitely born to be on stage i i can express myself much much better on stage than than even in a recording studio <laughs> Right. I'm more of a performing artist than a recording artist. Most hundred percent. That's fantastic. And you've graced stages all over the world. Uh, you continue to do so. Uh, I have two two follow ups. One is how are you coping with with the pandemic and no performances and, and just being being in a room, no stage. Have you taken to digital performances at all? Is that something you've considered? You know something. Just um, judging from my record all these years. 
Right. In the pandemic, I have done three online concerts and released an album and a video. So I can say that's more than I've done in a lot of periods. Of <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Amazing, I think that's, really. That's been the I case mean, for a lot of people. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's probably because of the whole digital platform. I mean, you can do it. You can do it sitting like, sitting at home. Right. See, the only thing is that the the compromise that I had to make was that Vada Karo um, is actually conducive to be a huge, huge, big, big scale video. Right. We really wanted to shoot outdoors, but and because of the anthem-like nature of the song. But I have to admit that it's really, really turned out to be the way it's meant to be. Even though we don't have any helicopter shots and we don't have any drones and, you know, we don't have thousand people, it is still, I mean, the essence of it is coming through so beautifully for the simple reason that I was lucky. I was really, really lucky. Um, okay. There were two gentlemen who were from London who uh, were doing a documentary on Dharavi Rocks. So fortunately, they came into the studio and they recorded this beautiful footage. And I had high resolution footage, like almost like I would have wanted to shoot for the video. Right. And they so generously gave me all of it because they shot for the entire period and they must have used a couple of seconds in their documentary. So, I mean, I had this whole plethora of wonderful, wonderful moments of, the, of us recording together, which you see in the video. Right. Okay. And then the second thing was uh, because of the history of the tune and because so many had done a kind of a soft launch earlier, I had already sung it in two shows. Right. Even though before it was released. Albeit in the earlier format. You know, without Dharavi Rocks right. in it. It was a 2018 release, I think. That was a couple of years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that was just with a very lovely track by Dhruv. Right. Uh, with the orchestration and stuff like that. It was very different. We're much more acoustic. Until my Dharani Rocks people came and made it totally relevant and contemporary and gave it another kind of magic. And I did a lovely sort of rap verse in there as well. A lovely rap. Lovely Hindi rap in that yeah. as well. So, which juxtaposed very beautifully with mine. Absolutely. You know? So, I had that footage too. I had those two, you know, concerts to work with. But then the other huge thing, which was a big, big challenge, was the, the rest of the footage. I mean, I had, a, I had a very, very dear friend in the industry who gave me the contact number of somebody in WWF. Mm -hmm. And I contacted them like at that time when I was doing the crowdfunding. Right. And I, I got access to footage from WWF, you know, which is absolutely incredible. But I had to take special permissions and I had to look, look through hours and hours and hours of their footage and see what would be suitable for my song. Right. And then I had to make an application for it and I got permission for only a few of them and then I had to eliminate and use only a few, you know, and then um, I gave that also to the editor from Bangalore who I contacted. And uh, Babu did a wonderful job. I mean, it was like a long distance directing, but sure. he, he knew exactly what I wanted. And I, 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 went, I went about it as professionally as I possibly could, given the circumstances, you know, and I, I did a complete storyboard for him. I put in photographs from the net, I put in photographs of me, I put in the lyrics, and I mm -hmm. made like literally like a static storyboard. And, and so I gave him the full vibe with the music. Right. And I said, I want you to make a music video like this. So he was so appreciative of the fact that he had a very clear brief and um, yeah, these are all new experiences for me, Vinit. Sitting at home and, and doing things and digitally. Me, of all people, I'm the Luddite of the family. <laughs> <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm glad you're doing it. And I love the fact that you've been so involved with it. I mean, storyboarding it yourself and sharing it with the director, I think, shows the level of commitment you have to the message of the song as well. Because it's clearly a song with a very direct, very loud message. Uh, although you yeah. deliver it so melodically, um, the message is so very clear. It's... It's now or never for climate change. Um, either we get up, get off our asses and do something about it, or we suffer the consequences for the stuff that we've we've kind of wreaked on this planet for the last 100, 150 years or so. Where where does that where did that message come from? And how did you distill it to being so direct and so simple? I think anybody who'll hear this song will sit up and think about it, right? And, and again, I'm not even considering the, the melodic nature of it right now, but it, it makes you think. How, how did you, I mean, what was the inspiration and how did you distill it to something so, so simple and straightforward? First of all, thank you so much. It's so good, you know, where you've struggled so much and then you hear appreciation like this. It's really, oh, it just makes everything worth it, you know. Um, I was approached to do this by a website called Planet Alert. Right. They wanted an anthem for their, for their website. And uh, they, they didn't really use it much. They, they practically, you know, packed up within a few, uh, within a very short time. 
So when I revisited the song, I, I said, uh, I took permissions, of course, from them. And they said, you're welcome to do whatever you like with it. But so when they initially approached me and they said something to do with the planet and, and everything, I happened to be uh, three months pregnant. And um, I remember waking up in the morning and I remember, remember looking out of the window and really actually thinking, what kind of a world am I going to be leaving for my child? Right. It's really, really, I really genuinely felt, you know, it sounds very dramatic, but it's true. So I, I just sat, I sat down right over there and immediately the rap came into my head. Then as far as the basic uh, Mukhra is concerned, the Hindi part of it, like I said to you earlier, I don't think you were on record at that time, but I said to you that my Hindi is average but adequate. Right. So, so that's the reason why I was able to put the message so simply. I wanted to you know, convey some way in which I could say that why the hell are we doing this and doing this kind of destruction with our own hands? Right. You know, and um, we don't have much time. Let's do something about this. And that's how it came out in my limited Hindi. And that seemed to work. And I think, I think simplicity is the key. Absolutely. If you listen to anything by the Beatles, I mean, you know, love, love me do. You know, it's love me do. Absolutely. There's nothing else in that lyric. And uh, you know I love you. I mean, yeah, okay, so that's the next one. <laughs> and, you know, right. it is, it's uh, probably easier to go and become an expert musician, you know, and, and, you know, do technically brilliant stuff than to actually really think of a very effective, simple song. Sure. And I don't do it regularly. I don't sit with my guitar and compose songs like the Beatles, but... I um, I feel that that's the reason this is the, the message is getting across so clearly because it's so simple. Right. I think that's that's been it, it, it grabbed me very yeah. clearly I, and, the first uh, first I listened. To yeah, it. and 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 it, it comes from the the heart because I mean I've grown up thinking about energy and clean energy and green energy because I have a brother who works in the field. Right. He's um, an associate professor at Yale uh, University and works with energy systems. And he, he actually studies and works, you know, very often he's come to India where he has actually um, gone into the smaller households, into the rural households and watched their consumption. Mm-hmm. And spoke, he's spoken to me about emissions and everything at a very, very young age. Right. So it was there somewhere at the back of my mind, you know, which is why I, I had a certain degree of conviction when, when I was actually doing this project. And then, of course, when I finally worked with the Dharavi Rocks children, mm-hmm. I mean, separately from the song, I mean, I, I work with it on uh, foundation anyway, I'm a trustee on it with Vinod Shetty. So, I mean, I've been to Dharavi, I've worked, I've done workshops with them, musical workshops, vocal workshops, right. you know, when we were actually conceptualizing Dharavi Rocks. And it was wonderful that I, I was able to christen them, you know. <laughs> and um, uh, they became Absolutely. huge. They started getting their own offers for concerts and everything. But what struck me was their creativity and their innovation. You know, they had done an installation of bisleri bottles, I remember, once when I went to one of the eco fairs. Right. You know, which was stunning. And um, you watch the way they lead their life. It is not a joke. You know, they make the most of their resources. They, um, you know, uh, they're so organized. And uh, with, with whatever they have, they still have smiles on their faces. They're so disciplined in so many ways. And still they have such a great time. Yeah. I mean, for me, they were examples of how to live, you know. So wonderful to hear. So, That's yeah. so wonderful to hear. Yeah, really. I mean, I mean, like I said, the song Simplicity of Vadakaro really grabs you. But it also comes in the line of songs that have been either part of your albums or songs that you've released as singles that are tinged with a social message. Do you think it's important for artists to continue to lend their voice to this? How, how have you considered this? And I'm, and, and I'm saying this, I mean, for my listeners, there are songs that in, in your discography, there are songs that address capitalism and greed and money. There are songs that address the girl child is a prominent theme. Your work with Lardley has been around for, uh, I mean, you've been working with Lardley for a while as well. So two questions in one, really. How, how do you think artists should lend their voices to social issues at all? And should they do that at, um, at all? And how does your association progress from here with, with climate change? I think those are my, my sort of two questions here. See, there's a very clear distinction between activism and being an entertainer. Right. I'm very certain that I'm an entertainer. Right. And I'm not, uh, I'm not going to preach. I'm not going to tell other artists what to do. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to speak for myself. Sure. Okay. Because there are artists out there, like, for example, the Kabir Kala Manch. Absolutely. You know, the ones who are really, really going out there. And it's clear social and political activism, activism through song. Right. You know, I am not that. You know, that's not me. That doesn't define me. 
you know, out of my entire album, there will be one or two songs which have a, a message of some sort. And that's only because I, as a human being, have grown up with some level of a social conscience for whatever reasons. Right. You know, with the way I've been brought up or like I said, for example, the influence of my brother or or just having watched my parents struggle a certain amount. You know, that's where Pesha came from. Then uh, my uncle, Bobby sister, he heads uh, uh, population first. And so therefore, automatically, I was exposed to the whole girl child, the horrors of the sex selection. So automatically, I got drawn towards it. Mm-hmm. So I have had individual experiences which have made me do these things. And, uh, you know, uh, I don't know any other way to express myself than through the videos and through the music. Right. I don't have any other medium. And I do feel a kind of a compulsion, I suppose, in a good way. Sure. You know, I don't feel like I'm going around with a jhanda and, and, and changing the world, you know. Um, but I, I feel that if I have something to say, and if I have a medium, then I'll be silly not to use it, you know. Words to live by, uh, absolutely. <laughs> you know, that's pretty pretty simply put. Yeah, that's it. Let me let me ask you this. When I see this being very consistent with with the way you've expressed yourself in your music as well. Very recently about Parihume, there was a rumor. Mm-hmm. Good. I'm very happy you said rumor. <laughs> it felt like a rumor because... Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the rumor was that the song was a pedophilia awareness song or an anti-pedophilia song. Um, which sounds believable. I'm not saying it... it doesn't, uh, but the lyrics are slightly different uh, in the way that I, I heard it. Do you want to dispel that rumor? Give, give us the, the truth behind it? Yeah, see, um, first of all, the lyrics had nothing to do with it. Right. I think it was more a reaction to the video. Right. But um, at the very outset, I'd like to say, I think it was supposed to be a joke. Right. It was supposed to be some kind of a tweet from some kind of a comedian. So I think the idea is to be funny Mm -hmm. and it wasn't even funny. It really wasn't. You know, it wasn't funny. I mean, no, I don't mean it in a, not in a way that I'm offended. Please don't get me wrong. I have an opportunity to say this clearly. Hopefully a lot of people will listen to this, but I believe the purpose of stand-up comedy, you know, is to be funny and to really, really make people laugh. And Mm -hmm. very, very often you do touch on sensitive topics. That is the whole thing. It's like, you know, look at the lighter side of things. Remember we used to get the Reader's Digest and it used to have that look on the lighter side. And you, you joke about things which actually are not things to joke about, but you say it in such a way that it has a certain twist in words to it or whatever. And you laugh about it. You don't mock it, but you laugh. Right. That kind of didn't happen. So what's the point, first of all? You know? It's unimportant. Right. But now that you asked me the question, if I wanted to do anything that was something to do with any kind of a social message, wouldn't I scream it loud and clear like I do everything else? Absolutely. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it have been in the press? Wouldn't I have been like, this is a song about, I would have said it. Right. You know? Right. And if Ram Madhwani, if he wanted to put a little element of that in his video, he didn't tell me, but I can see that it's open to interpretation and maybe that's what made him think about it. And so, Okay, fine. If that and I was, sure. it took me a little while to develop this attitude. In the beginning, of course, I was a bit irritated, mildly irritated, not because it was actually said, but because people would come up to me and just presume that that was the truth. Right. They wouldn't say, by the way, they wouldn't ask it the way you asked me. They would say, "Oh, we didn't know it was about that," and I would say, "Have you asked me?" <laughs> That's what used to really, really irritate me. It's a bit, bit presumptuous, a bit presumptuous. Right? And, and like exactly. to go to the author of the work and be like, oh, ha, ha. Yeah, you know. But and, and, and that too about such a heavy, meaningful... Yeah, but that only engage. is because of the power of the internet. Absolutely. Because Twitter can move at such a speed. I can't compete with that. I mean, you know, I mean, if I'm going to put something on Twitter, it's just going to tweet. That's what it's going to do because that's its job. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, that's what the... the it's not a, yeah, it's not a beautiful nightingale singing. It's some little birdie going tweet, tweet. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you about that though. You seem to have stayed away from social media by and large. Uh, oh. Is that conscious choice or you're just like not getting into this? See, I, there's been a luddightness to it. There's been a laziness. Mm-hmm. There's been a reluctance. Because I'm old school. I like to hold a CD in right. my hand. I like to pick up a telephone and speak to somebody. You know, I mean, I, I, mm-hmm. I know that this is the only way. I know this is the way forward. And I know this is the only way I could release Vada Karo, most importantly. And in fact, you can, you can ask uh, my friend Rohini from, um, from a radio station, a very popular radio station. She, Ramnathan. Right? She, Ramnathan. She, she was uh, with me after one of the interviews. And she said, you have to get Instagram. And this was a few years ago, okay, when Instagram was already hot property. And she looked at me right. with big eyes and she said, you haven't got Instagram. 
So then I said, no. <laughs> and then my, 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 my niece said to me, she said, you know, if anything, if you're going to release a new song, please just go get Instagram right now. <laughs> I think I think you have great advisors. Yeah. Rohini does a great yeah, job on Instagram. I think she's one of the best. Uh, one of the people who uses the platform for for its for its fullest potential. And your niece, I think the, that's yeah, absolute right I, age group. I think the correct age group. Correct. So I got it like a good girl, and I have done a lot. And I was literally learning on the job. I was speaking to Somni's team. And they were giving me instructions. Okay, so now you put this as a reel, and this you post as a story. <laughs> this you. <laughs> it was so much fun, and I know so much now. I know so much about it. So yeah, one learns as one goes along, and uh, I haven't really um, stayed away from social media. I think I've mainly used social media just for professional reasons. I mm. cannot get myself to just put a picture of me, you know, having a cup of tea. Right. I just. Right. Can't do it. My personal life is my personal life, and Instagram and other such things. They can, it can really get quite, oh, quite intrusive. I mean, suddenly in the middle of the night, you'll have somebody's name. This person wants to send you a message. Are I don't know you. I mean, see, a fan base is different. You know, a fan base. Right. It's it's a controlled thing, and you know people will be contacting a certain website or they'll be, you know, whatever. But because I manage everything by myself, I'm, I'm literally a one-woman show. I do everything. I've never had a manager for whatever it's worth, whatever, you know, moderate success I have had in my life. I've done everything by myself. Okay. Right. So, um, and therefore people can that, that easily contact me and access me. And, um, you know, I think absolutely. I think it's, so, it's, it's a personal choice, right? It, it's how much of the world you want to let into uh, your life and how much of your into life. Your, into, into your space. Right. Yeah. Um, but So that's the reason why actually I, I got Twitter in the beginning right. and then I took it off. I said that's too much. Right. You know, that's just too much for me. Twitter is a bit of a cesspool. That's, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think an entire generation of uh, music listeners need to know more about Sunita Rao. So if you're interested, please go follow Sunita at Senorita Sunita Correct. on yeah, Instagram. That's right. That's right. Um, yeah. That's where you can find her. Um, and my, she's I, there, I might as well uh, say this is my FB page also. I have a professional FB page also. Fantastic. Parisunita Rao.com. Parisunita Rao on? Parisunita Rao.com on FB. Sure. Yeah. Got it. And both are with a double E. Yes. Sunita both with a double e. e. Don't make it with, with an I. App. And Absolutely. also Pari with a double E. Pari also with a double E. Is that is that numerological or was that that's the that, that's the original spelling of the song? Yeah, that's that the is right. the original spelling. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah of course, of course, yeah. of course. Absolutely, absolutely. So you know, it has been wonderful talking to you. I think. I mean, I got a an education in in uh, independent music <laughs> from twenty years ago and squeezed and how into forty minutes. It is. <laughs> absolutely, and um, I mean, like I mentioned right, right at the top of the episode, big fan, and I think. Um, I'm an even bigger fan now seeing the passion with which you talk oh, about it so 30 years on as that's well. So Let me ask you just a couple of questions to round this, this off. Uh, it's going to sound like a cliche, although I try not to have mm. cliche questions, but what next? What next? I knew you Sorry. were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I have to, right? <laughs> Yeah, you know what? I used to I used to always uh, complain about this. Like whenever I would do a press conference or whatever, the release of an album, I would say, I'd be like, listen to the song. Listen to the rest of the songs. Go out there, get the album. And then give me some time to breathe. <laughs> you know? Okay, uh, I will cancel that question. The question is stands cancelled. No need, no need. I told you all the ideas are there. They're sitting there. In fact, my daughter, as we speak, my daughter is already designing the artwork of my next song and I don't want anybody to know what the song is until it is released <laughs> <laughs> wonderful wonderful okay. and um, I mean what I, where I was coming from was more from more of uh, I mean you're someone who's done so much right you've done theatre there's been TV there's um, so much happening right um, now with, with digital um, up, what I wanted to check was are you looking at anything new? Maybe something on, on an OTT? You, you mentioned um, acting. and Is there something? Yeah, the so definitely. Front? See, there's a number of things. I've gone, I've resumed my Indian classical dance. I learned uh, Bharat Natyam as a child and I've gone back to it. So that's really filling me up inside, making me feel very happy. And I am doing theatre workshops online with drama school. The DSM is, is doing workshops. So I do workshops with them. I have already been invited for a couple of events online because of Vada Karo actually. So I feel that's right. something that's now going to begin. There are going to be people who are going to ask me to come and either promote it or talk about it or everything associated with it, uh, musically or otherwise. 
and um, I'll continue to obviously work on some more material. I uh, it's difficult. It's difficult doing things when you have to sit at home. Right. So uh, you know a lot of yoga. Um, pay some pay a lot more attention to what's going on with my 11 year old in school. Right. Um, so I think I pretty much have my hands full and I'm running the home. So uh, theater and dance and singing, they will not stop. They will all happen in whatever capacity that they can happen right now. Wonderful. It will continue. Wonderful. Yeah. My last question is something that I ask all my guests and I'm especially excited to ask you this. Um, usually I ask for one entertainment recommendation from my guest but from you I'm going to ask for three albums that have been your inspiration or that's something that you keep going back to in your easy listening uh, time maybe yeah three music albums from Sunita Rao so uh, Billy Joel uh, The Stranger right and once you get The Stranger you have to get everything else right you have to get all of them, 52nd Street, Glass Houses, all of them. But the main one will be, you've got to get introduced to The Stranger. Then uh, Paul Simon's Rhythm of the Saints. Right. It's one of my biggest musical influences. And uh, you, okay. Oh, oh, this is so difficult. But if you haven't heard uh, the entire collection of the Beatles, you have to hear them. The entire thing? Not like, can you pick one album? Okay, so I know, well, um, Abbey Road. Lovely. Maxwell Silver Hammer <laughs> and Octopus's Garden. Silver Hammer will come together. Everything, right. yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, those are the album recommendations from Sunita Rao. Go check them out. Follow her on Senorita Sunita on Instagram and check out Vada Karo, her single about uh, climate change. It's got a wonderful video. Check it out. And Vada Karo, you will do something about climate change. Sunita, thank you so much for making time on this. It was absolutely wonderful talking to you. Thank you, Vineet. Thank you, Vineet. It's been great talking to you. All the best. Thank you so much. That's it from me. Uh, this is Vineet Kanabar saying goodbye. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. If you are not following us on social media, please do. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We'd like to thank the sponsors on the network this week. Thank you so much to Cred, Siet, and Global Victoria. Without you guys, this thing would not be possible. So, on the note, Maru Kinayat gives us an overview of the potential Twitter ban in India. On this round is on me. Gauri Devi Deyal was joined by actor-producer Purna Jagannathan to talk about her career in Bollywood, Hollywood, and theater. She talks about the upcoming season of the show, Never Have I Ever. On Cyrus Says, we had legendary musician Usha Uttop. She took us through her journey and shared her experiences as the unconventional musician. In the second installment of the Father's Day special on Akla Station Adulthood, Ayushi has a candid conversation with her father, Siddhartha Amin. On the Global Victoria Tech Talks podcast, we showcase some compelling new tech stories coming out of Melbourne. Whether it's from the buzzing gaming industry or the robust edtech sector, Victoria is increasingly becoming a hub of emerging technology. And we talk to some thought leaders and industry legends about the same. Catch all the action from the World Test Championship on the Edges and Sledges podcast. For our Hindi listeners, we have Kail Nidhi, which goes live on YouTube every morning. And with that, let's get you back to your show. 2020 is a difficult year. A global pandemic, protests, elections, recessions. You get the picture. What we need is a space where we can have nuanced discussions about global affairs and foreign policy. That's where I come in. My name is Hamsini Hariharan and I host the States of Anarchy podcast. Every second Tuesday, I speak to experts in the field of international relations to make a little more sense of the world. So join me on the IBM podcast app, website or wherever you're listening to me right now.